I titled my message this morning, Apprehended. Let's start reading in Philippians 3, verses 1 through 14. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So you see, you see that terminology there? It was like a play on words. It works even in the English language, but it also worked in the Greek language where he says, beware of the concision. And then he goes on and he says, for we are the circumcision. See how it's kind of like a similar type word. Uh, and he did that on purpose. And in the Greek, the words looked a lot alike also. All right, we're going to get into that a little bit more in a second. He says, for we are the circumcision which works, worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinks that he has whereof, he might trust in the flesh, I more. And this is why he says he, had, he could have confidence in the flesh if he did, because he was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yes, yes. yea, doubtless, I, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of yes, Christ. Amen. The righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. In Christ Jesus. Father, one more time, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would show up in this place and that you would be the preacher and the teacher and that your word would go forth according to your will in Jesus' name. So I, like I told you already, I titled this morning's message Apprehended and for a couple reasons. I mean, number one, the word apprehended was used and the English word apprehended was used at least three times in the text I read. But also it's, it's more about its meaning. So the word has a couple of definitions. And I just took this as similar in the Greek language, but I took this out of an American dictionary. Number one, you ever been apprehended before physically? <laughs> I don't want to sit here and talk all about my past, but I've been apprehended before, right? Apprehended or to be taken into custody, to be arrested or by an authority. And here's the example. The police apprehended the burglars. But number, the other one is to grasp the meaning of something, to understand something, to perceive it, right? And all these meanings of apprehended are swirling around in the Apostle Paul's life at the time that this passage was written. See, the main idea from his own perspective would be that he was apprehended by the Spirit of God. That's really what he's talking about. He was apprehended and overtaken yeah. by the Spirit of God. It completely spun him around, and now he's running after it. He's running after, I want to make sure I get this point out, because you know I use a lot of words. He's running after what grabbed a hold of him. Whatever it was that apprehended him, he was on a journey one day, and when he least expected it, God showed up in his life like a whirlwind and apprehended him, and he doesn't know 
know exactly what it's all about because none of us on this side of, of, of heaven are going to know what it's all about. But something spiritual grabbed a hold of him, a spiritual force so grabbed a hold of him and changed him on his interior so much that all he knew that he could do was to keep on running after that very thing so that he could lay hold of or apprehend that which had already gotten a hold of him. In addition, the Apostle Paul, while he's writing, has been apprehended and imprisoned by the Roman government. He's apprehended on multiple levels. He, he's been he's imprisoned, right, because of preaching the gospel. But there's an even larger force than Rome at work here. And once again, it was the power of God that had grabbed a hold of him. And that's one of the reasons... That I love hearing the testimonies of people. Yeah. Do you ever like to just hear people's testimony? I hope you don't get so hard in your walk with the Lord that, that you don't want to hear the story of somebody. Amen. Come Sometimes on. I just, I'm telling you right now, somebody will tell me, as a matter of fact, before church, Angie just started telling me a little piece of her testimony. She's told me other stuff before, but something about her dad and just different things like that. I, I can feel it like the tears like all up in my eyeballs. It's like I didn't want to act weird and start trying to wipe them, you know, just like yeah. try to ignore it. But it's like... I still get that way. I get real soft whenever I, I hear somebody's story. Sometimes like if I've done evangelistic type work, like if I've gone to prison ministry or done things and I just kind of like rub shoulders with somebody like we're walking and say, you know, this happened a lot when I was doing prison ministry with Russell Roseberry and I just ended up partnering up with somebody I didn't know. And I'd hear him talk, you know, and at some point in time I was like, so what's your story, man? Because it was like, I wanted to hear what happened. What? How did you? How did the Lord get a hold of you? What? What happened in your life that caused you to come to the place where you desired to serve Jesus? Yes. Amen. Yes. So there's something about people's testimonies that just tend to touch me. How they truly got saved? Because no matter how bad a person was living before, when the presence of God grabs a hold of them, their lives will never be the same. Amen. I can tell you something. Listen. When you truly get saved, your life will never be the same. Amen. And I don't care. Look, I mean, only the Holy Spirit knows when you truly get saved. Right. Yes. yes. My take on that, it comes straight out of Ephesians 1.13. It's not, you're not going to convince me just because you were in vacation Bible school one day and you said a little prayer that you definitely got saved. But I know this, it's not the preacher's job to figure out when you got saved. It's not your mama, your daddy's job to figure right. out when you got saved. Right. The Holy Spirit knows whether you got saved or not. And according to Ephesians 1.13, when you heard the gospel, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but when you heard the gospel, you received an earnest yes, of the sir. Holy Spirit. That's a yeah. down payment. Yes, that means when you got saved, when you meant business with God, God knew you meant business with Him, yes, and the sir. Holy Spirit came and moved into your heart. And I'm here to tell you, your life ain't never going to be yes, the same. Sir. You can try to run from Him all you want to. You can try to live life the way you want to live life, but He will be like a hound dog on you, and you will never be the same. There might even be times when you feel like you know, put Him in the back on the back burner and in the back of your mind, but your life will never be the same if you are truly saved, I'm here to tell you this morning, it's not going to be the same. You've been apprehended. Yes, sir. The question is, are we trying to apprehend that by which we've been apprehended? And that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about this morning. Amen. So everybody's looking for something new and fresh in their lives. I would say that most people probably wouldn't be itching to live Paul's life right now, though, you know, in that prison. <laughs> But if you had been going through a life of dead, dry religion and then God made himself real to you at the level he did with Paul, you'd probably look a little bit like him in your own way, I'm thinking. I mean, just think about that. I mean, have you ever really experienced the presence of God enough? And I, I'm not asking you to just agree with me. I'm just, I'm just trying to make a point. That there's a possibility that you, that you may not have ever experienced the presence of God at a level where you knew from that point moving forward, all questions are answered. God is real. I may not be exactly where I need to be. I might not know exactly what I need to know. But I don't have to question whether or not God is real anymore. Well, for the Apostle Paul, can you only imagine like growing up inside of a particular religion, dead, dry religion, and from a young boy being told all his life that this is the way things were and that this is the way reality was. You know, the truth be told, like a lot of us were, were you know, raised in religion. We were born into religion. 
and we just went through life. And it's sad. So many people still today, especially in the area where we live, they're just born into religion. They assume that this is the way life is. They don't know any better. They're not looking for anything different. But praise God. Hallelujah. Sometimes the Lord, be through one of us maybe, shows up and does this suddenly in their life. And he makes himself so real to them that it changes everything that they knew before. That's what happened to the Apostle Paul. His life was changed and he was, he was never the same. You know, there's a couple different reasons that Paul wrote the letter to the church in Philippi. But the focus of chapter 3 is both a warning about going backwards and an encouragement to continue moving forward. I said, it's a warning about going backwards and an encouragement to continue moving forwards. So point number one of my message this morning is why go backwards? I put a little side note, been there, done that. Why do I go backwards whenever I already know what the past held and I know what, how, what it did to me or for me? And then now I've, I've, I've experienced this, so why would, I, why would I move back? The Apostle Paul's past was much different than ours and that his life of religious, was a life of religious works in the Jews' religion. So you may, you may be disconnecting with me right now because you might be thinking, dude, I don't really care a whole lot about the Jews' religion. I don't really care a whole lot about, I don't know how I can relate to Paul's past. But I need you to know that there's a recurring theme in the, in the New Testament that challenges the believer to realize that who he is today is different than who he used to be. Amen. Over and again in the Bible, even in the Old Testament, but specifically the New Testament, there's a recurring theme. And it's important that we keep communicating this to the people of God, especially in a church like ours that does that do believe in, the, in understanding the message of the cross, that the faith that brought you in Colossians 2, 6 is the same faith that keeps you in. Amen. And that persistent faith in Christ and what he did keeps you right in the eyes of God. And you know what the good news? for that is that's how acts that's how grace can flow into your life listen grace isn't just i used to say this all the time remember that old britney spears song oops i did it again <laughs> that's not what grace is grace isn't like a little swiffer that you pull out to clean up your mess no see the grace of god yes it forgives you of all sins of your past present future so that you by the grace of god can enter into the kingdom of god but the grace of god is bigger than that the grace of god is power that is released from the holy spirit into the life of the believer to prevent you from ever doing the oops like Brittany was singing about to begin with. Amen. God's power is strong enough. The moving and operation of the Holy Spirit is powerful enough to give us freedom at the spiritual level so that we can start to walk in freedom and liberty and not have to stay in the bondage of chains. Amen. But God's grace works off of what Jesus did for us when he died on the cross. I don't mean to be redundant. I know that I've shared this all many times, but I don't think that we get it as quickly as what we ought to get it. Your faith has to have a focus or an object to focus on. Now, you ever thought about that before? It's getting kind of deep in here. Have you ever thought about that before? What I'm trying to say is, what is the object that your faith is supposed to focus on? The object that your faith is supposed to focus on is the plan that was written from the beginning before time ever was. The Bible teaches in 1 Peter 1.18 that, that, that you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver or gold that you received from the vain tradition like that you got from your fathers. In other words, your past and everything that you knew, whatever it was. You weren't redeemed with corruptible things like money's currency. But by the precious blood of a lamb that was foreordained before the foundation of the earth. That means that God, before he formed Adam out of clay and breathed life into his lifeless body, already knew that when he, formed, when he put Adam in the garden, he already knew that Adam was going to fall prey to the works of Satan and that Adam was going to bring sin into himself, thereby changing his nature from a nature that was more like God without sin to a nature that was more like the devil full of sin. 
And that all of Adam's offspring were going to inherit this unsavory DNA and that the way that God was going to redeem them or buy them back was through allowing his son to ultimately come upon the earth to die on the cross, bearing the penalty for sin, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God knew all this in advance. This was God's plan. This is God's plan. Therefore, when I say an object of faith, I hope I don't, I'm not getting too deep for you. Um, this, is, this, is how you, this is how you flesh it out in the real world. Back whenever I was really struggling before I really understood anything about the message of the cross and I was a Christian and I loved God, but like I had a lot of different things in my life. And I mean, it's not really important exactly what they were. I'm not ashamed. I could list them. I was looking at stuff on the computer I should have been looking at. I didn't need to go any further than that. I, was, I, was, I wasn't going to bar rooms, but who cares? It should have been just soon because I was getting a quart of beer and go guzzle it down in the backyard. Then I'd go into the living room and look at stuff I shouldn't have no business looking at. And I got to the point where I didn't really want to be that way, but I was bound by that. All right. And there was a, that power of that thing was stronger than, the, than my own willpower. But to make a long story short, whenever I started to get a revelation of what was written in the word of God, I began to realize that the object of my faith was wrong. None of this is in my notes. I'm just, this is what the Lord wants to speak Absolutely. right now to you. It's a little side note, a little line yop. This is the Lord wants you to understand something about object of faith. So whenever the Lord began to reveal to me the message of the cross, people were like, dude, I've been on about the cross. Come on, man. Move on to the bigger stuff. I can remember it being in a church, the old church. And they wanted me to write some curriculum. So I wrote some of the stuff I'm talking to you about. And I can remember this one guy had been in the faith for like 30 years. Man, this stuff's so basic. It's like, really? We're going back to the cross? What about the resurrection? How are you going to experience resurrection life if you ain't never really died? You know, that's the problem. We don't understand, spiritually speaking, we're not talking about a, the physical death of Jesus right now. We're not talking about the physical, animate body of Jesus dying on the cross, blood streaming down his body. Yes, that happened. Yes, I never want to forget that. I don't want to forget the high price that Jesus paid. We're talking about something spiritual, man. We're talking about something that was effected in the spiritual realm when Jesus died on the cross and paid the wage of sin that was laid upon the back of every human being when they received it in their first birth from their father, Adam. And it was broken in the spiritual realm for all mankind to be able to access and to be able to walk in the freedom and liberty. But if you don't know where to put your faith, then the preacher might teach you to put your faith in something else. That's right. I can remember going to one preacher one time when I first got saved. I was working in a pipe yard. I had all these thoughts going on in my head. Look, I had some bad thoughts, memories from my past. And all this stuff's rolling around in my head. And it's like the sin and the, I, and the memory. And I knew it was wrong. Nobody had to tell me that the things I was thinking in my head were wrong. I knew they were wrong. And I remember I went to the preacher. And the preacher said, you just need to pray in tongues more. So what the preacher didn't realize, and there's nothing wrong with praying in tongues. I believe in praying in tongues. I love it. The Bible says to build up your most holy faith by praying in the spirit. Amen. I believe in all of that. But what the preacher didn't realize was is that they were training me to actually put as the object of my faith, my prayer language whenever I pray in tongues. Mm -hmm. So now victory over my thought life. Is being sealed in my, in my, in my I'm not talking too deep for y'all, right? Y'all are with me. Y'all understand where I'm going with this? So now I'm, my mind is being retrained to think that whenever I'm overwhelmed by a thought of lust, that the answer to that is for me to put my focal point on praying in tongues and that that's what delivered me from the bondage of that sin. That's not the gospel. No. That's right. Jesus, his death on Calvary. D delivered me not only from the penalty of sin so that I can go to heaven, but also delivered me from the bondage of sin. Yes. Well, let me, this wasn't in the notes, but go ahead and put Colossians 2.14 and 2.15 on there. And I'm going to explain it to you in a second. And then we're going to get back to the passage of scripture where we are. But listen, we're talking about object of faith right now. So I can remember whenever I first started understanding this and I had a conversation with Danielle about this. 
And one of the things that everybody wants to do is they want to give you a formula for victory, right? You've seen it before. They write, write all these books. 12 steps to your new life. Your best life now. Three, three quick steps to victory. The keys to the victorious life. And they give you all of these little things that you're supposed to do. Get you some scripture and quote it. Pray in tongues more. Make sure you go to church. And get you an accountability partner. Oh, yeah, that's going to work real good. Trust me. You, you be careful. Listen, I'm not saying you can't. You can't come talk to me if you got something that, you know what I'm saying, that you're going through because I'm not going to go around telling all your business. But what I'm trying to say is be careful about who you who your accountability partner is. So you're going to, yeah, I know there's a script confessing your sins one to another. Part of that is really the, in the Greek confessing your faults one to another. Like in other words, if I wronged you, guess what? I'm supposed to humble myself and go to you. You, you know, yes, you go to the Lord, but I can remember one time I did something wrong and I felt convicted about it. And I said, Lord, I need you to forgive me for what I did right there. And it's like, and so, yeah, I got it right. And then for two days, it was still like I had a monkey on my back. And all of a sudden, the Lord was like, remind, you didn't think you were done, did you? And I can remember he wanted me to call. He was a preacher. I had said something in public about him. And, and he wanted me to call him up and for me to tell him. I mean, I was just being obedient. I'm not, look. And so I did. But when I did, it was like I felt the release. The point being is confess your faults one to another. It's not necessarily saying, oh, I'm struggling with lust. Let me go with so-and-so and tell him all my gory details. And by me telling him now the Lord's going, so, don't get me wrong. God, I'm not putting God in a box. Sometimes by, by allowing things to be exposed in the open, see, it does. It can disarm the enemy. It can disarm the enemy. I can remember that there was a time whenever I was struggling with all that and I, the quart of beer had gotten to the point where I ended up in a bar room and that's when the Lord spoke to me. I've told you all that story before about how my sister had died and how I was in so much pain. I ended up in that bar room and God spoke to me in the middle of that bathroom. But after the Lord delivered to me, I can remember sitting in a car with some dude one time and he, we had done ministry together and the Lord was telling me, I want you to tell him what happened over there. And for the first time, I can remember that was the first time I was ever going to tell another person. There was something trying to hold me back. Mm -hmm. Something trying to hold me back. No, that's our little secret. Don't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. But I can remember that when I did it, dude, it was like, whew, there was a free. And so I'm not trying to say that there's never a freedom in that. But if you start getting to the point where now you think, oh, that's the answer. I got to tell everybody all my business every time I do something wrong. And you start going, that is not going to set you free. Jesus already destroyed the powers of darkness when he died on the cross. And your faith and belief in that what he did was enough will release grace in your life, which is like a power source from the Holy Spirit. I don't play video games, but I'm pretty sure that there's some video games where when you in whether it's Pac-Man or some of the newer stuff nowadays, I guess like <laughs> Call of Duty or something. I'm pretty sure there's a way that you can like hit something and it splurges you with some power. And the next thing you know, you're like soldier of death and you're just like running all over everybody and everything's exploding and you're winning. That's what grace is like. I mean, that's a poor analogy, but that's what the grace of the Holy Spirit is like. It's bigger and it's more powerful than the power of sin. And it allows you to have victory over things that you can't have victory of over your on your own. No psychologist is going to do it. No AA group is going to do it. No medicine is going to do it. I'm preaching truth whether you like it or not. No new relationship is going to do it. No new job is going to do it. The smell of new leather in a vehicle ain't going to do it. The new house for crowd molding ain't going to do it. Ain't nothing else going to do it but Jesus and what he did at the cross. Hallelujah. It's a finished work. Gliding out the handwriting of ordinances. That's talking about the law. That was against us. The law was against you. Why? Because you broke it. Because even if you did the first eight, you didn't do the last two. Come on now. Which meant that you wanted somebody else's stuff. Covetousness. You wanted something that wasn't yours and it was bigger than you and you wanted it so bad. You didn't, you, you didn't keep the law. It was contrary to you. Look what he did. He took that out the way. You're no longer going to be judged according to the law. How did he take it out of the way? He nailed it to his cross because he kept the law and then he died for sins that had broken the law hallelujah that's why he resurrected from the dead it was inevitable people don't even think about it but it was like the wages of sin is death 
But Jesus didn't sin. Therefore, sin had no right to hold him down. The resurrection was going to happen. He busted out the grave. Hallelujah. He came to life. Amen. Next verse. But now we're talking about daily victory. We're talking about what are you dealing with in your life that you're going through that you need the grace of God flowing in your life. You pick your poison. It's you. Amen. The preacher got his own. Like, like Lauren Larson says, eat off your own plate. There's a big old buffet out there. You don't need to know what I'm dealing with. I don't necessarily need to know what you're dealing with. We all deal with something, but the answer is the same right here. Amen. And having spoiled principalities and powers. Every time I talk about this scripture, I got to tell you the whole story. This isn't even my message this morning, but it's so beautiful. That word in the Greek, spoiled, that, that Paul, this is Paul talking to, that he chose right here, had a meaning. The meaning had to do with the Roman Empire. The idea was is that whenever Rome, you know, Rome was famous for conquering other nations. He just conquered. They would conquer and swallow them up. Conquer, swallow them up. Conquer, swallow them up. Make them part of their empire, right? And so the idea behind this word is, is that whenever Rome would defeat another entity, another nation, they would take the leader, like the generals of that army, and they would strip them of all their armor, strip them of all of their, uh, you know, whatever that stuff, insignias that showed who they were, captains or generals or whatever, and bring them back to Rome and parade them through the town of Rome naked. Like, like belittle them, humiliate them. Yeah. And the crowd in, in Rome would be like, <sighs> you can only imagine those stuff fluff, floating in the air, you know, like a big old festival. <sighs> Everybody's going crazy. Oh, this is our nation. You want to talk about patriotic pride. We're the most powerful empire on the world. Look at these weakened Kings that are now under our command. That's what it means. In the spiritual realm, Jesus did that to the demon spirits and the fallen angels. You and I need to understand something. When you're being driven to go in a direction you're not supposed to go, it ain't the Lord telling you to go there. It's the enemy trying to destroy your life. It's the enemy trying to gain power and hold on to power in your life. Robert, I believe it was Robert and I were talking just this morning. We were talking about bondages. Bondages in people's lives. And when the enemy puts his claws in you, and Robert said, made the comment, yeah, man, the claws got little barbs. Mm. You know, that's a bad thing, dude, when you get a fish hook cut, caught in you. I got a little technique I used in the ER one time, but that's another story for another time. Let me tell you something. If you're not careful and you don't disengage that barb, you're going to pull meat out with it. You're going to have a big old string of meat hanging out whenever you pull that thing out of there. Listen, that's how the devil is. When he sinks his claws in, he don't want to let go. He don't want to let go easy. But I'm here to tell you that what Jesus did on the cross humiliated him. Yeah. A demon spirits, fallen angels, the power that they try to exert in your life. I'm here to tell you, I don't know what you're going through this morning. It might sound like I'm just speaking a bunch of fluff. But I'm here to tell you the object of your faith needs to be that Jesus already did it at the cross. And because of that, there's grace for you to access. And that grace in your life, it's a, it's a moment of faith, man. It's not me, oh, let me get my list of scriptures to quote. There's nothing wrong with getting a list of scriptures to quote. It's not me, I got to do, I got to do, I got to do, I got to do. It's Jesus already did. Yeah. He already did it, he completed it, he finished. And because of that, you have access to grace. And the grace of the Holy Spirit made, made a show of them openly. That's what it says. He made a show of them openly and he triumphed over them. How did he do that? Look at that. It. That's right. That word it, what is it? It's antecedent. It was going back to the cross. In other words, the word it right there is connected back to the cross when you find out what it's talking about. Listen, I got good news. It's a simple message, but I'm telling you, it's written throughout the entirety of Scripture, but it's completely contrary to the majority of what we've been taught in the church. And what we've been taught in the church is that in order for you to have victory, you got all this. Yeah, you got to do something. You need to believe that the Lord did it. Hallelujah. Glory. I can remember the first time I was talking to Danielle about it. I'm like, yeah, everybody's trying to give us a formula. So I got me a new formula. <laughs> Whenever the enemy, are you ready for my formula? When the enemy started trying to attack me, whether it was in my thought life or whatever the case, this was my new, this was my new little thing that I did. And ain't me. I'm dead. I'm a new man in Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus already did it. Hallelujah. I just think it in my head, man. To the point where sooner or later, I didn't even hardly have to say it out loud anymore yeah. in my head. No, that ain't me. I'm a new man in Christ. The old man is dead. A new man has been resurrected to newness of life. Jesus 
De decapitated you, you lying devil. I'm going on and on, but you get the point that I'm trying to make. I didn't necessarily recite all that in my mind. The main idea was I reminded myself that Jesus had already completed the work. That Jesus, all right, that was my new formula. You know, sometimes I'm going to be honest with you. I'm just being transparent this morning. I need to go back to that little formula in some areas of my life. I need to remind myself. You're a lying devil. You've been decapitated. You can try to put your barbs in me all you want to, but the Lord disengaged that hook. Yeah. I kind of want to tell you how you get that fish hook out, but I'm not going there. All right. Here we go. Let's get, let's, get, uh, let's get back here. So the danger that Paul is warning against is that these teachers of false religion are trying to bring the Philippians backward instead of leading them forward in the right direction. So for the Apostle Paul, it was an old form of religion. For you and I, I don't know. It could be a lot of different things. It could be, it could be like I said, it could be old, like you had a problem with relationship after relationship after relationship. I'm just saying, like some of us were like that. I know I was. It could be a problem like you, you, you drank too much or, or whenever things went on in your life, you went back to, the, to alcohol. Or when things went on wrong in your life, you went back to pill. Am I just telling the truth or am I lying? People find things that they become dependent upon, and even after they give their life to Christ, there's a tendency to go backwards instead of forward. The enemy tried to tempt Paul to add religion. We don't have time to go there right now, but I can prove it out of Romans 7. Yeah. The enemy tried to tempt Paul to add religion to his Jesus, thinking that was going to fix the problem. The enemy wants you and I to add something other than Jesus to our Jesus. Oh, well, Jesus just doesn't work. No, that's a lie. Jesus does work. And it don't matter what the enemy manufactures. Factors. It doesn't matter whether it's crack cocaine. Well, they didn't have crack back in the day of Jesus. Yeah, but they had the man from Gadarene that was filled with so many demons that he lived in a he lived in a amongst the tombstones and he cut himself and he cried like a wolf. And the Lord said, "Be made whole." And the next thing you know, oh, he's sitting there in his right mind. Listen to me. If Jesus can do that, he can deliver somebody from crack. I guarantee I can pull somebody out here and ask them to come up here and they can tell you, man, I smoked crack, I smoked this, I did that. And listen to me, Jesus set me free. Hallelujah. Oh, don't get me wrong now. The devil's always lurking and he's always trying to whisper and breathe over your shoulder. He's always trying to get you to take another little tug on a pipe or put a little another bump in your van or whatever the story is or, or go another down that route again. And sometimes he's successful. And guess what? And, he, and he's all too willing to display your mess up in front of in front of the world. They're like, ah, hi, Jesus, don't worry, but that's a lie. And he's the father of lies. I'm here to tell you, Jesus has set you free. Amen. And when you get tired... Hallelujah, like that man of Gadarene. And you get tired of living amongst the tombs. And you get tired of cutting yourself. And you work, and you, but we preached this a while back. And you joint participate with the Holy Spirit. And you allow Him to work in your life. And you allow Him to set you free. Amen. Hallelujah, man. He'll set you free. That's right. Praise God. So for Paul, it was old religion. For you and I, it might have been from our past. Look, look what he said right here, though, in verse 2 of where we were. Philippians 3, verse 2. He said this, he said, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. See, he refers to some false teachers as dogs and he, re and he uses the word concision for a purpose. See, during this time in church history, people that were of Jewish descent viewed Gentiles as dogs. They viewed people like you and I. You know what a Gentile is? Everybody like tuning me out. Dude, don't know what Gentile is. I'm done. Cut you off and I'll come back. With... No. A Gentile is anybody that wasn't a Jew. So if you were from Iraq, if you were from Iran, if you were from uh, Greece, if you were from Rome, if you get the point, if you were from North America, America del Norte, because you were an, uh, an original uh, uh, Indian or whatever, you're a Gentile because you weren't born a Jew. You weren't born in Jewish descent, and so therefore you weren't born into the family of the God of Israel. Okay? And so what he's saying is, is that what I'm trying to say is this, is that they would have viewed Gentiles as dogs, right. the Jewish people. But Paul flips the script on them. See, they would have, and you know why they would have viewed Gentiles as dogs? You know what separated Jews from Gentiles? And I know I've taught this for a long time. Jews were circumcised. 
Y'all yeah, remember that, right? It was an outward sign of their covenant with God. It's an Old Testament thing. People don't have to be circumcised today in order to be in right relationship with God. It was a big old mess in the church. We learned about it last Wednesday. But this is the point. The Jewish people, that was the separation point. I will say this, though. Physically, there was a cutting away of skin that separated the Jewish people from the heathen or the Gentiles around them. God has always expected his people to look and to be different than the people of the world. That's kind of what my message is on this morning. We're not talking about no physical circumcision. We're talking about a circumcision yes. of a heart. Yeah. Yeah. Where well, the Holy Spirit changes on the inside. At some point in time, our life has to start looking different than it did before, folks. Yeah. We can't just say one thing but live another. Yeah. That's not normal Christianity. I'm not saying it doesn't go on for a while. I'm not saying that there's not a process to God changing us. But at some point in time, the grace of God is supposed to be changing us on the inside. Amen. To where it becomes manifest outwardly. That word concision literally is a play on words and it means mutilators. Because what they were doing was they were coming back where Paul had taught these Philippians who were Gentiles, weren't even Jews, and said, man, you've got to be circumcised if you really want to be right with God. He said, they're the dogs. They're, they're false teachers. They look at you as dogs, but they're false teachers. They're mutilators. If you try to make yourself right in the eyes of God by doing or adding this false religion to what, to what you already have in Christ, they're making you go backwards instead of making you go forward. See, the voice of the enemy can show up in many ways or forms. He can show up as a preacher, a parent, an old friend, even a boss or a customer. For that matter, but look, this is what he is. According to what I'm talking about right now, he's a voice. The enemy is a voice that is trying to convince you that what you need to do is go backwards, mm -hmm. wherever backwards is for you. Whatever your backwards is, that's what the enemy will always try to whisper to you whenever times get tough. See, you got to learn. Listen to me. This is so simple, but listen, I know that there's a spiritual the, the enemy will try to put spiritual cataracts over our eyes right. so we can't see it. When I'm going through something in my life, there's a temptation like for Israel to go back to Egypt. Remember what they said? Oh, we remember the melons and the leeks and the garlic. Why did you bring us out here to kill us? We're ready to go back to where we used to be. When times get tough, listen to me. You remember what this preacher said? Because I don't know, you might not be back next week. It's possible. But if you're not back next week and you're here and in a couple, three months from now, you, you, you're going through something and you see yourself back where you used to be. Right. Remember right. that the preacher told you that it's the voice of the enemy. Yes. yes. It's the voice of a dog. It's the voice of a mutilator that's trying to get you to go backwards <laughs> instead of going forward to keep faith in Christ and what Christ did to get you through this speed bump in your life. Yeah. Oh, no, this. This speed, this speed bump's too big. The only way I can get through this is I got to go, oh, I got to numb the pain. I got to go back to what it used to be. Yeah. That's a lie. Yeah. And it's gonna, all it's going to do is help to keep you entrapped and make you move backwards instead of forwards. Yeah. See, but like Paul, you've already been there, and you know that isn't the way to go. Amen? Look at verse 4 of chapter 3. He says, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. He's like, these guys are trying to get you to put confidence in the flesh. He said, though I might have confidence in the flesh. Look at this. If any other man thinks he has whereof to trust in the flesh, I would be the one to even believe it more. Because why? I was circumcised on the eighth day. You know what that means? Circumcised on the eighth day? It means that he was truly Jewish. See... Ishmael, look, I know I'm getting deep. I, I feel like maybe I shouldn't got to go this deep, but, but it's okay. Let's teach a little bit. Israel was formed from Abraham. You remember that? Father Abraham. Abraham is in the Old Testament. Okay? And that's where the nation of Israel came from. It's important that you know this stuff because you'd be walking down the road, man, dude, I don't know nothing about God. And hey, hey. Mom or, or hey, bro, uh, guess what I found out today? The God of Israel is the same as the Muslim God. That's what some Muslim told me. That's a lie from the pit of hell. But if you don't know nothing about the Bible, yeah, Abraham, from Abraham came Isaac and Ishmael. From Ishmael came the Ishmaelites, which is now the current state of Islam, but they didn't show up till 600 AD. Muhammad was a lying prophet that was possessed by the devil. Right. They, they, there's, there's 
documentation out there that they found him seizing and foaming at the mouth after he was over there giving his quote unquote prophecy. But if you don't know any better, you don't even have to talk to a Muslim. You be getting your hair cut somewhere and some clown's like, man, I don't know about all this religion stuff. It's the same God. What's the big deal? No, it ain't the same God. That God was a moon God that was already something that was in existence from the time of Babylon. Yes. Abraham had a son, but his first son was a son of the flesh. His name was Ishmael. He was circumcised at 13 years old. Abraham had a son of the promise. His name is Isaac. He's the one that, that Abraham put wood on his back and he carried it up a hill. And when he was about to thrust a knife in his chest, the Lord put a ram in the thicket in the place of that, uh, that mountain was called Jehovah Jireh. God provides because God provided a sacrifice on that day. And it was his son that he provided. Just just like Abraham brought his son upon that hill to kill him. God was saying, hey, through your son Isaac shall your seed be called. Isaac was circumcised on the eighth day. What Paul's saying is, listen, if you want to have confidence in the flesh, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I wasn't circumcised at 13. I'm not an Ishmaelite. I wasn't circumcised whenever I started to believe as a proselyte, meaning some Johnny come lately that was converted later. No, I was circumcised on the eighth day. And not only that, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I know my pedigree. I can call, I can look backwards on where I came from. I'm the, I come from the tribe of the second son of Jacob and Rachel. It's not important who that is, but it is important, but I'm not going to go there right now. I come from the second son of, of Jacob and Rachel. I come from the tribe of Benjamin. The first king of Israel came from that tribe. As a matter of fact, his name was Saul. My name was Saul. Listen, if anybody got something to trust in the flesh, it ought to be me. I come from the real thing. He says this, he goes on to say, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews, touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He said, I know what the past has to offer. These clowns are trying to make you go backwards. I've already been there, done that, tried to add religion to my faith. It only messed things up. I'm telling you, don't go backwards. You better move forward. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The thought is that if anybody ought to know that this old life isn't the way to go, it's me. Mm. Now stick your plug your own life in there, man. Yeah. I mean, you might not be, we're not made talking about circumcision today, but I mean, you're over here talking to somebody out there on the sidewalk. Right. And this dude's over here trying to convince you that his life, man, oh, dude, no, it's good, bro. We got some good stuff. I'm just using that because that's how I was back in the day. I know y'all weren't all like, right. <laughs> oh, no, they got some good stuff going around, man. Dude, good stuff? No. <laughs> you're not going. You ain't going to take this brother right now. I'm not saying that the enemy can't tempt me and make me fall. That's I'm, anybody. Look, Lord, but the grace of God. Yeah. But you ain't going to convince me that what you call a good stuff is ultimately going to be good for me. Because right. right. the good stuff back in the day liked to destroy me. Come on now. Took everything I had away from me. The good stuff is Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. The good stuff is the new life that He wants to give to me. And he's trying to convince me to just trust him and to walk with him. Amen? Amen. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, the trouble and heartache and pain that your old ways may have caused you. You may have been good at what you did. I put a little quote in here. Man, I was good at sinning. Boy, I was a good sinner. Yeah, that's what Paul said. I was the chiefest of sinners. That's kind of what Paul's saying, except he's talking about religion. He's saying, man, when it comes to the false religion that these mutilating dogs are whispering in your ears about, I was the best at it, and I know it's not the way to go. So his name was Saul by birth. You know what Saul means? It means desire. The name Saul literally means desire. Many times that's the problem that we have with our past. We remember certain things that we miss and we have a desire to revisit them. But that was the past. And like the new Paul, we have a new life. The word Paul means small. Small is, is synonymous with humility. Yeah. God wants to make your old desires small in comparison to his desires for your life. Yeah. Dude, I get so frustrated sometimes. Like, it's all, and You know why? It's because... Even as a preacher, listen, the words, I don't care how passionate I try to say it. I don't care. I know I make fun all the time. Little veins pop out of my head. My face turns red. That, that, that's not going to set somebody free. 
The Holy Spirit has to give somebody revelation. I can't tell you, sometimes it's like you sit there and you talk even to people that you love and it's like you know that they know because you raised them and you've been talking to them. Uh-oh. You've been talking to them about it since they were knee high to a grasshopper. But listen, until they can allow the Lord to get, be real to them, until they can allow the Lord to make it real to them, the enemy keeps whispering in their ear and they're being convinced, oh man, like, you know, to go back and that it mean No, you got to come to the place of revelation where you start to desire what God has for you more than you desire what you want for yourself. Amen. You know, I just talked about the fact that his name was changed. And in the Bible, the word name, anomos, means character. It's describing the nature of something. And that brings me to my next point. Because the past is the past. And when God changes something, he changes its nature. Mm -hmm. He changes it on the inside. And it's so deep yes. that it changes the outside. See, that's what therapy will try to do. They'll try to work on your outward self. But that's not what God does. God works on the inside. Yes, God works on the inside to change things in your nature. Amen. That brings me to point number two. Something changed me, so I have to keep moving towards it. Look at Philippians 3, 9. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness, which is, by, which is of God by faith. Look, real quick, I just want to make this, make this point. I know y'all seen me do this before. But when he's talking about law, he's talking about something that is external. He's talking about trying to perform and to do something right to be seen as righteous. But, what, but the difference between what the gospel does is the first time you were born, your nature was that you were a sinner like Adam. But when somebody told you the good news of the gospel and you put faith in Jesus yes. and what he did for you at the cross, God allowed your nature to be changed. God changed your position and now you're in Christ. Hallelujah. That may not make a whole lot of sense to you right now, but I got to tell you something that when the father looks at you, he no longer sees your past. He no longer sees your failures. He sees you in Christ. He sees what Jesus did for you. See, when you get born again, there's a literal change from your past where you're given a new life by God in Christ. The old man born the first time and Adam dies with Jesus on the cross. And now in the father's mind, you are found in him. You are connected to him. You have been given his righteousness through faith. Amen. Amen. What a deal. You had a past, but God doesn't hold it against you. He erases it in Jesus. It's almost like he just takes some red paint, the blood of Jesus, and he paints over it. All of that. And that's what the Lord sees. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Philippians 3.12. I got to at least use this scripture because it's where the title came and then we'll move on. Amen. We're going to close here in a second. Just bear with me. Philippians 3.12. Not as though I had already attained. In other words, he hadn't arrived yet. I don't know about you, but I haven't arrived yet. He said, I haven't arrived yet. Uh, either were already made perfect. But this is what I do. I follow after it. Remember when we talked in the beginning, something apprehended him. Something overwhelmed him, overtook him. And he says, I'm following after that thing. Not the concision, not the mutilators, not the voice whispering in my ear, whether it's my boss, my mama, my daddy, my sister, my brother, my friend. No, the voice of God. He said, I'm following after that. He says, it's not as though I were made perfect, but I follow after that which got me. If that I might apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. You get that? I've been overtaken. I've been apprehended. A spiritual force grabbed a hold of me. I'm not going to go backwards because I know that this thing is real. I've seen the change in my life. And what I would desire to do is to go forward, to go forward with the Lord. Amen. Because if I go backwards, it only results in death. But if I'll go forward, I'm moving towards what God has called me to do. Listen, it's so hard for you and I to get a revelation of this. The Apostle Paul is writing this from a Roman prison. We get, so, listen, I know I say it all the time. We're physical creatures. We like, we like things that make us more comfortable. I get that. Right. I'm one of the worst. Would we feel the same way if we were stuck in a Roman prison? Mm -hmm. 
See what the Apostle Paul is saying is, I haven't apprehended, but I'm going to keep on moving forward. I've been overtaken by a spiritual force. I might be chained to a Roman soldier right now, but i got to move. See, that was the next scripture that he used in, in, in Philippians 3, 13 through 14. He said, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. I forget those things which are behind, and I reach forward to those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. So many times we want to throw in the cards for something physical that the, that the life on earth offers. Because you know what? It's just so difficult to see yes. the real prize. Yes, the Lord. Yeah. Because we don't have spiritual eyes, we have physical eyes. It's so di- But what the Apostle Paul had a revelation. I'm working for something that I can't see right now. Yeah. Amen. I can't make you see that. I can't make you see with spiritual eyes. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. But I'm telling you. The Bible teaches the believers of God that this life, that there's so much more to life than what we're experiencing right now. And that what we're really looking for, the prize of the high calling of Christ Jesus, amen, is what God had, has ultimately intended for his people. I'm going to go ahead and close with a story. I, I use this story a lot, but it comes out of Luke because uh, I'm, just, I'm just kind of enamored by this woman. It comes out of John 12. You don't have to turn there. John 12, if you want to read it later. John 12, 1 through 4, and then Luke 38 through 40. Two little spots right there to talk about this woman. Her name was Mary. Mary, I'm not talking about, there was a lot of Marys that followed the Lord. There was Mary Magdalene, who was the one that was possessed by devils, who was a previous prostitute that the Lord set her free. There was Mary, the mother of Jesus. This Mary had a sister named Martha and a brother named Lazarus. They became very close to Jesus. And the first occurrence that we see comes out of that passage in John where, uh, where uh, I'm sorry, it was uh, the first passage is in Luke chapter 10, where Martha saw the Lord. It doesn't really go on to deep explanation, but she saw him somewhere and she invited him to come eat. Luke 10, 38. She invited him to come eat. And y'all remember the story because we talk about Mary's and Martha's, right? And the Bible says that she was real busy. She was getting all the food together. And the Bible used the word. It said that she was cumbered about with many things. The word cumbered means she was very anxious. She had a very high anxiety level. She was totally stressed, dude. She was like trying to get everything done because Jesus, the, the, I mean, everybody's talking about Jesus and he's literally at my house. And it's like, I got all this stuff that I got to do. I got to get all this stuff together. And I, can't, I don't want to do it. But I mean, if I could, it's like Mary sitting down Indian style. Well, maybe not Indian style. She might be sitting like a little lady. I don't know, side saddle. But she's sitting down at the feet of Jesus. Yeah. And what ends up happening is, is that Mary, Martha, gets frustrated. She, she's like, I'm doing all this work. And look at her. And so she goes to Jesus. She's like, everybody in this house can see me. And look at her. Do something, Jesus. I could preach a whole other message about that. Right? So many times whenever we're not satisfied with our own life. So many times we're not satisfied with our own life. Things that are going on and we look at somebody else and we think that we're maybe doing better in life. Than, like we're serving the Lord better than what they are. and But yet at the same time they seem to be promote, getting promoted and we're not. And we're like, what is going on? Yeah, I worry about them. You need to worry about yourself. The Lord might be using that in your life to get you where he wants to get you. Yes. That's a good idea. Now, I want you to just get up there and just play something. Yes. Lord, I don't know. I'm doing all this work. Look at her. She's not doing what she's supposed to do. And you know what Jesus says? Martha, Martha, you're cumbered about. You're anxious about many things. But Mary has chosen the right thing. There's a whole lot of things in this life that you can put your focal point on, put your attention on. But listen, what the important thing is to put your attention on the Lord and to pay attention to, to make his business your business. Right. We need to look towards that and to to press towards the high calling of Jesus Christ. Later on, there's a story of John. And she's been paying attention, I believe. Once again, we don't get a whole lot of insight into what really happened. But to me, she's been like like she was that day, sitting down at his feet. That's how she was. And she's been paying attention to the things that he'd been saying. 
Other people around him not really so, paying so much attention. Even his own disciples not really paying that much attention to what he's been saying. Because he's been saying, listen, I'm about to go to Jerusalem. I'm about to be mistreated. And I'm about to be crucified. The Bible says that she walks in there with a pound of nard. It was some type of an ointment where a spice from India was mixed in it. And they would usually uh, put it in a box uh, or some type of a, like a, a alabaster box. Was They would seal it in like a, it was almost like a, you ever seen a clam when you open it up or an inside of an oyster where it's that, uh, that uh, fluorescent, you know, translucent, that color. They, they would make something out of that, but then they would seal it up to where the only way to get it out was you had to break it. Scholars say that the amount that that thing would have cost a pound of that stuff at that time would have been uh, like a year's wage. Mm -hmm. The reason that a woman would have sell, saved that and held on to that was for the biggest day that a woman could have back in those days. It might, you know, nowadays in our society that we live in, people may think, oh, gosh, you know, because we've been touched by feminism a little bit. But for a woman back then, the biggest day for her was to find the man that she was called and to marry that man. For her right then and there, she was like the only man she wanted to have anything to do with was Jesus. She had heard his words. She had paid attention to what he was saying. And what she said was, I'm not going backwards. I'm moving forward. I'm not going to get distracted. I've been apprehended. Hallelujah. I've been apprehended by the words of the master. Hallelujah. And I'm about to give him everything that I have. Yes. I don't know about you this morning, but this is a word that was for me. Amen. I know I've been apprehended. I need to be a little bit more like the Apostle Paul, though, and try to apprehend that which I've been apprehended by. 